What is stress in linguistics? Um, well, stress is probably what most of us imagine it to be. It's emphasis that's placed on a particular part of a word, a particular syllable of a word. Um, and that may take a number of forms. The syllable might be slightly louder, the syllable might be slightly higher pitched. And one of the nicer things about the Germanic languages, uh, sort of English, Dutch, German, is that from the perspective of a learner, stress is pretty easy to get the hang of because in core vocabulary words, in words that are native to the language and not borrowed from another language, stress always falls on the first syllable of the root of the word, which also happens to be, in most cases, the first syllable of the word altogether. The only exception here is when there's a prefix at the start of the word, so butter, having, enough, because, nehmen, gemacht, and so on. So English, Dutch, German, and Frisian all work like this. In English, you can have primary and secondary stress, like in the word absolute, absolute, which has a secondarily stressed syllable, an unstressed syllable, and then a primarily stressed syllable. But other European languages more often have variable stress, which means the stress can come anywhere in a word, although this will usually be governed by rules. So what's the point of having variable stress if languages can clearly do without it? Well, it's just another way of differentiating words from each other, if you see what I mean, and adding meaning. So I'll give you an example of a loan word that's been borrowed into English from Latin. This sequence of phonemes can be pronounced in two different ways. It can be transfer or it can be transfer. The first one is a verb, I'll transfer you the details, and the second one is a noun, the transfer of the details. So you can see that variable stress allows you to get several different words out of one string, string of phonemes. I've just seen four magpies, I can't remember what that is. Is that good? I can't remember. But Proto-Indo-European had variable stress, and we can actually work out when in the course of its development to Proto-Germanic it levelled its stress to being all on the first syllable. In other words, when did this branch of Indo-European, and I'll have it on the diagram on screen, lose its variable stress? The trick here is that some of the sound changes that turned um, Proto-Indo-European into Proto-Germanic rely on there being variable stress. So specifically, we're thinking about Werner's Law. And to understand Werner's Law, you have to understand Grimm's Law, which you might already know about. Grimm's Law describes a series of sound changes, what we call a chain shift, like a sort of dominoes falling into each other situation, in the Indo-European branch that became Proto-Germanic. To sum them up, the voiceless plosives become fricatives. So, b turns into f, d turns into f, g turns into h, g turns into h. All the voiced plosives, b, d, g, g, were devoiced, and like a sort of reverse dominoes, they, they fell into the places that the original voiceless plosives had left, and they became fricatives. They became b, d, g, g. Finally, the aspirated plosives became either voiced plosives or fricatives. So, b, d, g, g become b, d, g, g. This was all well and good, and it explained the majority of cognates between Germanic and non-Germanic languages, but there were still exceptions, and Werner's Law is an explanation for those exceptions. Werner's Law says that wherever a voiceless fricative like f, f, or ch, has an unstressed syllable before it, it becomes voiced. So to give an example, Proto-Indo-European uber, when affected by Grimm's law, becomes ufer. Because the voiceless fricative f has an unstressed syllable before it, Werner's law takes place and it becomes voiced. Uver. This is the word that becomes over in English. So Werner's law accounts for a lot of the exceptions to Grimm's law in a really succinct way, but it relies on there being unstressed first syllables of word roots in some words. Let's look at the alternative. So we have uper. Let's say that very early on the stress in all words in this branch shifts onto the first syllable, so we get uper. Grimm's law still takes place with no issue and it becomes ufer. But now, because the syllable before f is stressed, it wouldn't be affected by Werner's law and we wouldn't have the word over as we have it today. In terms of absolute dates, the sound changes described by Grimm's Law and Werner's Law probably happened sort of during the first millennium BC. I've heard around 500 BC for Grimm's Law, but I imagine consensus drifts around a bit. So shortly after that point, stress in Germanic languages landed on the first syllable of the root in all words. 
Towards the end of the Old English period in most dialects, vowels in unstressed syllables started to become indistinct, so they, they all slowly fell in articulation towards the middle of the mouth. So originally they may have been peripheral vowels like a, u, e, but they all started to fall towards a central position of just being a uh, or something similar. And that was complete by the early Middle English period in most dialects. We can tell this because writers started mixing up the spellings of these vowels and then eventually just settled on the letter E. So in Old English you'd have ich habe, in Middle English ich hover. In Old English bera, Middle English bearer. So you can see e and a have both merged to e. Uh. Eventually, at the ends of words, a lot of these unstressed syllables were eroded away altogether. So nowadays we just say, I have and bear. So why have I been careful not to mention the North Germanic languages? Um, well, North Germanic languages, particularly continental ones like Swedish and Norwegian, have weird features when it comes to stress. And in fact, these are things that, as non-native speakers, we can... Presuming you're not a non-native speaker, you might be. But we can... Um, we can hear these things immediately without knowing any of the language. They're very immediate things, they're very obvious things. And in Norwegian and Swedish, this manifests in the form of pitch accent, which exists in, um, to my understanding, most but not all dialects of Norwegian and Swedish. To use standard Swedish as an example, you have what's called the acute accent and the grave accent. So the acute accent is pretty much the same as a normal English stress pattern in a native word. So, bokken, bokken. The grave pattern is different. It only occurs in words with more than one syllable, and it has two peaks, two points of higher pitch. For nan. It works differently depending on where you are. So in some dialects, the pitch contour might be a bit different. So instead of being for nan, it might be for nan. But it only applies to specific words. And I've, I've, I've never tried to learn Swedish myself, but I've heard a lot of learners complain that courses a lot of the time don't teach pitch accent very well, although I'm sure some do. So the question now is, where did this come from? Is it uh, an Old Norse or Proto-Germanic feature that's just been lost in all the other languages, or is it a very recent thing that's just sprung up in one prestige dialect and sort of spread around? Well, there are two major hypotheses, and both of them put the appearance of pitch accent during the Old Norse period. So one of them puts it during the Viking Age, sort of 800s, and the other one puts it later at the start of the second millennium, so sort of 1000s. I've got neither the knowledge nor the qualifications to comment on which one I think is more likely to be right, but I'll put an interesting paper in the description that outlines both. Thank you very much for watching.